Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in beautiful downtown out in the boonies, Canterbury. Over the years, I've been under stress at various times and some projects that could warrant a quick finish, I did. And I have found some secret methods that I'm gonna share with you tonight. Now, we're gonna use as our material tonight as the focus, cherry. And it's a common wood that gives a lot of um, a beautiful rich color. It's a very common North American hardwood and it's beautiful. As it ages it gets richer and darker and beautiful um, kind of reddish brown colors come more and more rich as it deepens in color. So but there's a few little idiosyncrasies and weird characteristics about cherry that you need to work with and be aware of. And one of them is what a lot of people refer to as blotching. And that uh, is actually, when you put the finish on, you get these darker splotches. And it's annoying, because you, you felt like, oh, I saw such beautiful wood, and what are these little splotches in there? Well, what they are typically are rolling in the grain. There's like these wide kind of rolls and they're kind of random. So you don't get the beautiful pattern of curly maple or anything like that. Most of the time you can live with it. <laughs> but um, I wanna show you the, the way that you can minimize it when you know it's present. Now, not every cherry board has that potential to blotch. You, you have to have like this perceptiveness when you're handling wood. Every board is not the same. In fact, you might be frustrated at the end of this night because you're like, man, I thought I was going to get a straight formula to bang this out. And if you like straight formulas, you can do that, but you're not always going to get the right result. If you're trying one approach that doesn't match what's going on on that surface, you're going to have a kind of dissonance in your results. It's not going to look nice. It's going, but if you can get, come in with the right kind of approach that gets along really well with what's going on, on in that particular board, you'll have a harmony with that board. All that is I'm saying is just be observant. And this board actually has the potential to blotch. I picked it intentionally. Do you see these little dark kind of yeah. areas? Like, what's weird is if I spin the board 180 degrees, all of those dark areas now will be light areas because it's the way you're looking into the grain. If the grain is rising toward you, it reads darker. If it's rising away from you, it's bouncing light and reflecting and looking lighter. So that's why you have that issue at times with wood. So I can see that this has that potential. So I'm going to make a decision here up front. Like, how do I want to get along and harmonize my finish approach best with this piece of material? Well, if I put a thin type of penetrating oil finish on there right from the get-go that's going to saturate in and that will actually enhance the blotchiness so it's not recommended on a blotch potential board you, you go with a thin bodied finish because you'll get that saturation intensify the blotch um, the other thing is if you put a water-based dye stain on there, that also is gonna penetrate deeply and enhance the blotch. If you put it right dead on the wood, it will bring that up a little bit more. This board, we're going to treat a little differently. I'm gonna show you two methods on this board. And one of these methods might be a little controversial. The method I'm gonna show you first is borrowed from the French polishing technique that I referred to uh, a couple weeks ago with um, George Frank, I believe. Yeah, the French, um, the French finisher. He, he did a lot with French polishing and he described in one of these issues of Fine Woodworking Magazine of how to 
um, create the French method of French polishing. And the way he began the thing was kind of different. You probably thought, wait, wait, that can't work. He takes mineral oil and he wipes it on the whole surface and then he wipes it all off. Mineral oil is a non-curing oil. It goes on the wood and so then he comes on top of it with shellac which is an evaporative finish and it's curing right away on the thing and you think oh my gosh that's gonna be a mess you've got a non-curing oil you're putting on shellac but it's not a mess it actually harmonizes a little bit with the shellac and it it can migrate through the shellac and whatever but it, it doesn't end up causing problems as you go through the process of of um, French polishing it's a lot of it is just held in internal in the finish and some of it migrates out and is like spirited off with the alcohol near the end but all that's to say I'm gonna borrow that technique because I don't have time to wait for an oil varnish to dry right remember we're under a deadline so <laughs> if I put it like when I'm dealing with something that's non-blotchy, I will, usually it's nice to put like a Danish oil on there if you're going to use shellac and then come on top of it with a shellac. If it's blotchy, you want to put a thin coat of shellac on first if you want to use oil varnishes. That way, the shellac puts that kind of shell, that thin shell on there. Then when you come on with the oil varnish, you'll get the protective, rich, beauty, beautiful qualities of the oil varnish without the saturation, which is gonna pop the blotch, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Now, so what I'm gonna do is show you, well, we'll see how much the blotch comes out. We're actually going to put mineral oil on this board first. We're using the French, French polishing method. And why would I do that? Well, it's a very heavy bodied oil, so you don't get the same saturation as some of the thinner um, varnish oil, varnishes like Danish oil, or whatever. So we won't get the same penetration, but we will get some. So, but I, what I want you to see is how oil enhances and enriches the colors in the cherry better than going with shellac alone. So you could just shellac this whole thing, never get that saturation and penetration, and minimize the blotch. But here we go. Let's do the French polishing method. I'm going to put a piece of tape across here, and let's just wipe this on. And here I've got the mineral oil, okay? We're going to now, I'm going to wipe this on, and I don't want to let it really penetrate heavily, but here's that heavy-bodied non-curing oil. I'm going to wipe it on, and I'm not putting on a real thick coat, just enough to kind of wet the surface with the oil, you know? It's almost like I was going to start French polishing, but we're going to use the cheating, fast <laughs> shellac method, because we're in a hurry. Now, this method I used when I was in a particular hurry, uh, man, it must have been 15 years ago, on um, a special frame that I made for the Canterbury Library. In fact, you can, if you're ever in town and the Canterbury Library is open, you can go in there. It's a tiny little thing right in the center of town. And in the back, there's a quilt that was made by quite a few ladies in the community years ago and they wanted to display it. So we had this big wall frame I made out of cherry and I forget, I did dovetail the corners and have these verticals, glass-like, shatterproof, tempered, all that. And um, I had to get that thing down there and I used this exact method. I first wiped the mineral oil on there and then I got a couple, three coats of shellac, rubbed it out and brought it down the next morning. You know, this all happened like in the afternoon. So, and it looks beautiful still today. There's no gumminess, no nothing. The, the mineral oil match. All right, so there we go. We've got that on. And you notice I took a paper towel and I'm wiping it down and it looks kind of dry. Now, you're seeing the difference. This is just oil on, on the board, but it is bringing up a little richness. But do you see a little of that blotchiness? 
So let's go with shellac on the whole thing now and see how that reads. Now, if you've not been around, I've talked a lot about shellac as the fast, quick, easy, beautiful finish. It's been around for a long time. And so a lot of times when I'm talking about shellac, I'll talk to you about how you make your own with grains and flakes. I'm not talking about that tonight. We don't have got time to make our own. We're gonna just go to the store and buy some shellac already mixed up for us, no worries. So this is a great product for shellac off the shelves. A lot of the box stores have them. It's, it's around everywhere. It's been around for generations. And um, this, I'll use the clear shellac on this cherry because I don't want to add too much amber. Like there is an orange kind and it would just put too much orange color. That's fine for darker colored woods, but lighter colored woods, too much orange, looks like you've been you know, going to the tanning booth a little too long. Then um, this is another version of the very same product in the aerosol can. You don't get as much for your money, but you get the convenience of the can. Um, I, if you don't have a spray gun, you can use this stuff, but I do. So I mix my own. When it comes, it comes with a ratio of three pounds of flakes, shellac flakes, to one gallon of denatured alcohol excuse me so they call that a three pound cut because you've got three pounds of flakes in one cup now uh, we want to use it at a, about a one and a half pound cut i took a scoop out poured it in there and then almost fill the second one with denatured alcohol you really don't want to go another full liquid because it's, it's a long story, because you're not taking into account the flakes in that liquid. So just take a little less than the equal amount of the alcohol and you will get close to a pound and a half cut. Very forgiving, don't worry about it. Uh, then I stirred it up. Now we're gonna get our finish on. So rather than the aerosol can, I've got a spray gun. I'm not gonna get into the use of the spray gun tonight. We wanna just talk about the finish for tonight. But I've got a spray gun, I've got my pound and a half cut gravity feed gun. All right, we're gonna turn on our little dust collector to move the air. I'm not gonna be spraying much, so I just want you to see this. Okay, here we go. All right, so that's, I can see it's flashing off pretty fast already, but I don't know what you can see with the camera. Can you see the difference? Yeah, I can see the line. The line, this is about the dividing line where we put the, the oil. And um, so we've got a little richer. Now, I would do a couple coats on this, which I did on the back side. So let's flip it over and see what we got. This has two coats of shellac. From here over is the oiled, and from here over is just the shellac. So notice the difference. Can, I don't know how you're seeing this. Can you see it? Yeah. So you're getting this richer depth of color from the oil on the surface. And you are seeing some of the blotch, but the nature of cherry is that grain rolling like that. And if I, let's just look at it this way and keep your eye on what you think is blotch, okay? Just keep looking at that spot as I rotate it. Now when we get upside down the other way, that spot you saw is gone because it's now reversed. So when it's in place, it doesn't, unless it's a really particularly bad board, it's part of the nature of cherry and, but you just want to minimize it. So by using that heavy bodied oil and shellac, we've got kind of the best of both worlds right there. Now, you could go just with the shellac. It's fine to just go with the shellac. You'll end up with a little lighter cherry, but this is still going to age and darken and get rich in color. But I find this is the reason why I often recommend oil wiping varnishes or, um, you know, like tongue oil varnish. I'm always saying that is a nice or Danish oil on cherry because of this kind of rich, color that brings out of the cherry and over time it oxidizes beautifully and brings out the really mag magnificent color. So 
This is a good example. I'm showing you right now the contrast if you go with just shellac. Can you use um, like denatured alcohol wash over it before putting any finish on to, to diagnose if there's going to be a blotching issue with that board? And yes, that's a great idea. You can also use paint thinner. That takes longer to evaporate off. The denatured alcohol will show you almost right away, but you got to look kind of fast because it happens quickly. I wanted to also cover how fast you can finish a table. Right? So here's my table. It's just a little spin-off version of the shaker candle stand. We actually made a course out of it and full-size drawings are available of this table. I've had some beautiful photographs sent to me by quite a few of you and I'm been stunned with how you've the combination of woods, the beautiful bases and the stories behind it. It's been really great. Now I am, this is very um, prime kind of cherry. I know this does not have much blotch in it. Just, it's just got that real even kind of classic cherry look. So we're going to just quickly get the mineral oil on there. Look at that. It, it looks like I'm oiling this finish. Now it could be Christmas, it could be the day before Christmas and you could be just starting. You don't, <laughs> and I'm telling you, you would have this under the tree the next morning if you got up early <laughs> and got it out of the shop. Is the spray one and a half pound? Yes, one and a half pound cut is what I typically will spray with. You can go a little thinner or heavier, but I usually don't go more than a two pound cut to spray. And that's usually just the last coat. I, they're asking, what pound cut is the Zinzer spray? They used to say on the can, I have talked to their reps and I wasn't sure if they were still three pound cut because the seal coat version of the Zinzer shellac, which is wax free shellac, it's called seal coat. It's a blonde type clear shellac. That is only a two pound cut, but they assured me the orange and the clear that I showed you in the can are still a three pound cut when you get them. Carrie asked, um, since shellac creates a barrier coat, does the tongue oil on top still penetrate to the wood? Well, it depends how thick the barrier coat is. Like when I've used, if you use a one pound cut, you'll get some saturation, but it'll, It'll seal, but it'll saturate into the end grain. You will get a very minimal penetration in certain areas of the material. But um, for the most part, I would, I would answer that in general to say no. But there, are, there is some, depending on how thin and the nature of the material you'll get. But for the most part, just think of it as being on top of the barrier coat. That's, and... Um, but it, I've done that and the oil on top of a wash coat of shellac, the wash coat of shellac minimizes the blotch and then the oil goes on and it's really the best of, you get kind of the best of both worlds in a way there. All right, so I'm covered with mineral oil on here. And that took me about three minutes. Um, the clear is not de-waxed and the orange is not de-waxed, but the seal coat is. So that has the other traits. Now you can buy your own shellac flakes and it will come either waxed or de-waxed and mix your own. You get that ultimate freshness, but it's more expensive. And, but the nice thing is once you mix it up, it has a shelf life in a cool kind of dark place of a good year. You know, I don't, after that you start wondering. Um, however, some people I know have kept it for much longer if you have it in like a dark container. Oh wow, this is a good place to show a problem. <laughs> Look at this. So this doesn't usually happen, but I've got these two little glue spots. See that? I can see how those little white spots there? When you put the oil on, they show up as light spots because the oil is not penetrating the wood right there and you've got the color of the... Here's how I handle that. I just take a card scraper 
and I just lightly scrape it. Get that, make sure you get it off. You're getting through the, the glue. And I'm just lightly hitting it. And then take some fine sandpaper, and I believe that's 220, and just detail that spot. You just want to sand until you can tell that there's no more of that white there. And the oil has already started to move into those locations. And the paper will gum up a little bit because you've got oil on it. And then you can just take your mineral oil, go back in there, and you'd never know. Now we're going to just finish wiping this down really well. Man, that glue spot set us back. But I know you haven't seen many people recommend this process because maybe there's some flaws in it, but I, I'm telling you, I've used it, and I'm gonna show you one other method right after this. All right, so let's go ahead. Now we've got our oil on there. Let's say that took us a good five minutes, right? Now we're going to spray it. So we've got our spray gun, and this is so fast, it's a joy. So many cool ways of applying it. You can brush it. You can't really wipe it on that well, but you can pat it on in the French polish method, or you can spray. And it's really good when you have lots of variation in your piece, because it'll, like chairs, are super easy to spray. So I'm gonna turn on my dust collector again. Here we go. Just go up the leg. Okay, now we can put it on the bench. I usually do this in the finishing room. <laughs> Hang on a second. All right. We had a question, what other woods can you use this on? I'm assuming you mean the mineral oil and the shellac. I honestly don't do it on any other oil woods, but most of the time I'm, I'm just going with the shellac if I'm in a hurry on other woods, <laughs> you know? Um, you could use it on, you could try it. I mean, that's why I'm always talking about experimenting. You could use it on walnut, I'm sure. Look at that, that whole thing, like the first, getting that first coat on was what the spray component was probably three minutes, maybe, right? And then I've got to, I'll lightly sand this and put another coat on. That will take me about five, seven minutes altogether. And, or 10, let's say 10. And then another 10 minutes for the last coat. So we're looking at like a half an hour to get the finish on here. So that's pretty good. You know, uh, for how fast can you finish the table base? Now, we didn't talk about the top, but the top would be at least the same, probably a little more. So the time you'd have in finishing this table would be a little over an hour. All right, so what I want to show you now is the next tip that I've never shown you. And this one has to do with what do you do with sapwood? That's the other aspect of cherry that we haven't talked about. We covered now um, the, the issue of blotching. And I'm sure we'll get back to that at some of the point because I know we haven't hit all the problems. But the other issue is sometimes you have some sapwood that you have to incorporate in your project. And you want to minimize it and mute it so that it disappears or looks more like heartwood. So, if you're not familiar with the term, in a lot of trees, that the outermost 
um, section, say like, I don't know, the 10% of the, the tree, the out, just inside the bark, is lighter in color and like markedly lighter. And it only happens in certain species, like uh, walnut has a very de defined kind of sapwood that's whiter and it would be brown here. The cherry is reddish in tint. It's kind of pink at this phase because it's still natural, it's light. But you can see how strong that contrast is with the white sapwood. Now, most times when I'm working on a project, it's if you can cull it out, it's usually cut away so it's not included in the project. And you're left with just mostly the rich red color of cherry. However, it can be used in a decorative manner or um, with like that issue of the bed. I was able to hide the the sapwood in opportune spots. I do have some on the rails, but I toned them in a little bit using a technique similar to this. So here's the technique I want to show you is how to tone that cherry in. And I've done some processes down here and I'm going to peel these off one at a time. I don't want to contaminate them with what I'm doing. So that's why they're there. Uh, so here we are. I'm going to tape off this first little section Let's say like right there. So we can remember the natural, what it looked like before we did anything to it. Okay, we'll just go right across here. Just go. And now we're going to use the method I like for coloring this. Now, there's a number of ways you can do this. You can do it um, right directly on the wood, as I'm going to show you. Or you can get a wash coat of shellac on there and then you can use, you actually can use a water-based finish on top of shellac. You'll get some color change because the water will be there and you just wait for it to dry off. But a, a better way to get fuller color is to use an alcohol-based dye stain once you've had the shellac on. There'll be a little more control, less with, because you've got that on there. But it's going to melt in so you've got to move kind of quick. All right, so here we go. I'm going to use the water-based dye stain. And here's my secret recipe for toning the sapwood of cherry. I like this product here. Um, now, you can find this, this color of dye stain or one similar to it in a lot of different products. But this is from Wood Finishing Enterprises. We put a link in the description. Early American Maple Medium Amber. Now, you can get this in one ounce, four ounce, eight ounce. And it's quite in, inexpensive buying it from like Wood Finishing Enterprises. This bottle I've had for years, and it's only the four ounce. Uh, some of the other ones that I used a lot more, I would buy the eight ounce, and they last a ton. So usually you're mixing it up just about the amount you need because it will go bad um, in about a year or sometimes less, especially if you have metal exposed to it in the jar. Um, so I like using these canning jars because the lids are usually waxed, so it keeps it a little longer. So there I write what it is, and then I've got the concentration here. This is one teaspoon per 16 ounces. So I mixed up only four ounces, so I used a quarter teaspoon of the powder. Uh, you can weigh it or whatever, but that's the typical mix that I'll use. All right, so I'm going to take this paper towel. We want right. to color this, so I'm just going to get a little dip. Just going to come right down. And this is very forgiving because it's water-based. We're going to very lightly go over next to it. Just use that brush stroke, that fan. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've hardly done anything to this. It may look darker, but, um, but that's a nice way to add a little tonal quality. Now, I have actually used this to give an aged look or a deepening or an evening of tone of cherry by using this color on the whole thing. And to do that, I would usually cut it half that concentration. So half a teaspoon per 16 ounces, okay? So there you go. I've got that on there. I'm going to let it dry. So now we can see the difference. We went from white to that color. Now as it dries, it's kind of fooling you. We're not getting an exact match here, but 
Now, this one I did earlier, so it's dried, and I now see uh, that area, and we're ready for shellac. So we're going to put our first coat of shellac. We'll just put a thin wash coat, same pound and a half. This is really quick, so I'm just going to spray it right on here. What's the PSI, Tom, of the spray gun? Uh, usually you spray shellac. It's such a thin material that at about... 30 to 35 pounds, 35 might even be high. You want to spray it at the max, right at the point where you're atomizing it or pulverizing with the air pressure so it, it makes the droplets tiny. But spraying shellac is very forgiving. It's not because it's not a heavy body finish like a lacquer, so you don't need a ton of pressure. The droplets can be slightly larger and not be a problem. All right, so check that out. That's our first coat of lacquer and already we're getting a pretty nice hiding this is the sapwood right here so we'll take this back now you can see what's happening we went from white color now and now we want to put a second coat of shellac on oh why didn't i put that there <laughs> i should have done them both at once this has one coat of shellac on so this is like this dry so i'll just tape this over even though it's not quite dry I don't want to double it up right now. And here we go. Now we're starting to see the color coming in really nicely, right? And this one is dried two coats of shellac. So here we are, dried two coats. And I already lightly sanded it. And the last thing we want to do is put on a just a, a little lacquer, okay, to top coat with lacquer. Now the last time I used, um, I've been playing around with these aerosol cans because I've not used lacquer in the cans like this since, as I mentioned, we used to use Deft with uh, Pug down in North Carolina 30 years ago. I like the Watco results, but I don't, I don't like the aerosol spray nozzle. It doesn't give you the softer fan and you have to really move and be come stay far away or you get some puddling and dripping. But I picked up instead a can of the Minwax lacquer and it's a nice product. It sprays a really nice little fan and I got the semi-gloss the same as this Watco lacquer. I wanted the semi because uh, the satin can sometimes be too cloudy and kind of hazy. So, but what I discovered was the semi-gloss on the Minwax version reads a little shinier, has a higher gloss factor than the semi-gloss of the Watco. So I think next time I'm going to get, I'm going to pick up a can of the, of the satin it's one step down and see how the Minwax performs there. It's pretty nice and, and the nozzle is definitely better. See, it's got this type of nozzle. I believe that's the same as the Deft has. It's just a better quality. It's not just the spray can type nozzle like that. And it gives you a, a softer fan. So this gets good marks for that. I'm not as happy with the sheen. I'd like it to be a little softer, but you can knock that down with steel wool. We'll try the Minwax this time, so you get to see the, the nozzle. And I'm probably gonna do a little comparison of the Deft, the Minwax, and here, and I'll probably pick up a couple other cans and, and play around with it one time, because lacquer's a great product. I mean, it's, it's a little dangerous. You don't wanna be spraying clouds of it without adequate ventilation. So I often wear, I'll wear a um, charcoal type mask in it, filters out the, and plus with a fan in the wall, you're good to go. Lots of times, I won't even use the lacquer on top. Like chests of drawers, the only place I would put uh, some type of varnish or lacquer would be on the top, where it's gonna get glasses or something like that. Let's go ahead and spray this. This is this region right here. So this has two coats of shellac, and now we want a top coat with the lacquer. And Oh, let me turn on the fan. Here we go. Now 
Beautiful. There we have that. Now I'm going to take this away and get rid of this because this is hiding the earlier lacquered surface. Isn't that sweet? So it's going to soften like that. And then if you want it to look even a bit softer, I use the steel wool. I don't want to contaminate my... And this really just kind of burnishes it and softens the sheen if you don't like... I, I usually always rub it out with fine steel wool like this, especially the shellac. And then it would get the wax polish. And man, that is just silky, beautiful, smooth. You see that luster? So if I put a little polish on there, it'll bring up the fullness of the finish, which is hard to see. I'm spraying right next to freshly applied lacquer. But, um, so this gives us the beautiful... Are you seeing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there we go. We've got our storyboard here. Let's check it out. So here we've got our bare cherry with a big strike of sapwood. Here we are toning it in with our stain that we mentioned. We have that link in the uh, description. First coat of shellac, two coats of shellac, top coat of lacquer rubbed out with wax. And see, you can still detect, here's, here's the, the line. It kind of came up and then it started diving down at the end. So the sap was down here. You can kind of see it. So it is a little bit different tone, and that's fine. It mutes it greatly, so you never notice it um, like you did. And how about over time, Tom? How will that? Uh, it will stay about the same. This is going to deepen and darken. So technically, you could make it even a little darker. I feel like it could use a touch more red, too, but you get that mapley look. But for most cherries, it works really nicely. And like I said, you could apply it here first and then put a thin coat over the whole thing. So you cast a little bit of the maple tonal quality to it and it makes it even blend even a touch better. For black walnut, they have a color at uh, Wood Finishing Enterprises or a lot of other places if you can't get it from them. Uh, standard brown walnut will work great. So you can try that. Brown is very easy to kind of melt melt in and uh, try that. And one of the other things you can do, like if, if you're not totally satisfied with this, you can tone the shellac. And that's, so you don't always get it like right on the wood. And don't worry about it because you got a lot, of bag, a lot of tricks in your bag. You're gonna add a little alcohol soluble toner or concentrated color to your wash coats of shellac while you're building it up. And you could kind of mist over this area to bring it in a little more and then do the full amount. So there's lots of ways to kind of sneak up on the color and, and kind of finesse it as you go. It's like you're using these micro layers of toning to get it going. Another method to affect that tone control, they make these aerosol cans with various colors you know, you have cherry or walnut or whatever, and, and it, they have beautiful spray nozzles on them. And you can mist it and just fog it in kind of to the area that needs a, just a touch of color or a shift of tonal quality. And you can get, you could control color, blend, m match things to antiques. Lots of great control by using that kind of toning color. And that would go on top of the wash coat of shellac or after you've got a couple of coats of shellac. It kind of gets sandwiched between layers of shellac and then you apply your top coat, which would likely be, you know, a lacquer or something like that. But like I said, yeah. finishing is an art. It's almost like music too, right? You've got to harmonize with the wood, the material at, at hand. And that's why it's so good to have a a lot of methods and understanding of what the various methods bring about on the surface so you end up with a pleasing um, composition. Well, if you enjoy this content, please 
subscribe and share and like. Come back and see us next time. And also, um, if you want to go deeper, head on over to epicwoodworking.com and get on the mailing list because we are going to be sending out new announcements of things that are coming available and you'll be first to hear that way. So thank you so much for being part of this and spending some time with us here tonight in the shop. We look forward to seeing you next time.